we're going to look at Acts 4.13 to begin. And the message I titled it, Peter, the breaking and making of a pillar. And we will see that played out throughout the study. So Acts 4, verse 13. Let's read that, we'll pray, and then I'll get into the study. Acts 4.13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as we see your word, as we look at this pillar, this man whom you called who you um, chose, Lord, and, and drew him to yourself to, to be a pillar in your church, Father, as we look at his life and as we see the love that you had for him, Lord, may we also see that that same love is for us, that that same forgiveness is for us, Lord. May you open our eyes, Lord. May you fill your servant's mind and heart. May you fill me with your spirit, Lord that I would be able to share those things that you have showed me through your scriptures, Lord, that my brothers and sisters would be encouraged in your word today. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God is perfect, and he never makes mistakes. There's a story that I've read that always illuminates that for me. There was a king who, who did not believe in the goodness of God, and he had a servant who in every and all circumstances would always tell the king, my king, do not be discouraged because everything God does is perfect. He makes no mistakes. And one day the king and his servant went hunting and along the way a wild animal attacked the king and his servant managed to kill the animal but he could not prevent his majesty from losing a finger. Furious and without showing his gratitude for being saved, the nobleman told his servant, is God good? If he is so good, then how come I was attacked by an enemy, and I, I mean by an animal, and I lost my finger? So the servant replied, my king, despite all these things, I can only tell you that God is good and knows the why of all these things. What God does is perfect. He is never wrong. And outraged by the response, the king ordered the arrest of his servant. And later, he left by himself, mad and furious, on another hunt. And he was captured by savages who made human sacrifices. And on the altar, ready to sacrifice the nobleman, the savages found the victim was missing one of his fingers. So he was released. You see, according to them, he was not complete. So he could not be offered to the gods. So upon his return, he comes back and he releases his servant. And he says, oh, my servant, God was good to me. I was caught and they were going to sacrifice me. But because I'm missing a finger... They let me go. But let me ask you something. If God is so good, why did he let me get mad and put you in jail? And he goes, oh, my king, think about it. If I had been with you, they would have sacrificed me because I have all my fingers. <laughs> Story makes the point well. Isn't that the truth? Romans 8.28 tells us, And we know that all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. God is working out his plan in every one of us. Yet sometimes we are in a trial or in a disappointment, and it's easy to lose sight of that fact. Today I want to look with you at some of the portions of the life of Peter. Peter's life illustrates for us from beginning to end how Jesus took a man, broke him, and made him a pillar in the church. And I started in the book of Acts because it shows the product of the man that has been with Jesus. I mean, I started in the end because in the end we see here in Acts how Peter, let me give you some examples, how, how we show the product, we show the boldness, who this man had become. And as we look at it, let me, let me give you some examples. For example, in, in Acts 2.41, we see that after preaching a powerful sermon, it says that about 3,000 people were added to the church. And then later, Peter was walking by a lame beggar, and in Acts 3, 6, it says that he looked at this lame beggar, and he looked at him and he said, Silver and gold I do not have, 
But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then later we saw that the religious leaders put him in jail on trial for healing the lame beggar. And Peter confronts them. And he gives glory to God for what had happened. And he tells them in Acts 4, 11 through 12, This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. And then he tells them, nor, nor is there salvation by any other, for there is no other name in under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And then we read again here in Acts 4.13. These religious leaders saw the boldness of Peter and John. Peter was a pillar. The Apostle Paul reminds us that he was a pillar in the church. He was a man bold for, the witness, for his witness to Christ. And these, these verses that we just looked through show a bold Peter. He was fearless. He was controlled. He was effective in his speech. And it's easy to see this Peter and marvel at his boldness, his undeterred commitment. But as we know, that wasn't always the case, right? Peter wasn't always this bold. Before a, a young servant girl, he said, I have no clue what you're talking about. I don't know him. He denied Christ, right? That was his biggest failure. And yet here we see him bold. So what happened? What happened with this Peter? Well, we see here that he had been with Jesus. They said he was uneducated. And I've often thought about this, this you know, many people point out, use this verse as, well, we don't have to get educated. But if you think about it, think about this Peter. You know, when, when you get educated nowadays, you go, what, four years? If you have kids and you work full time and all that other stuff, you take 10 years like me to get a four-year degree. But hey, you get it eventually, right? But four years, if you can go full time, you get an education. And they say, well, Peter wasn't educated. But no, he wasn't educated in the way that they were. But he was educated. Think about it. He, sp he spent three years walking with the creator of the universe. You know, in school, we sit before professors who have taken some time to study certain uh, material, certain subjects that they hopefully have learned really well, and they kind of impart to you, but they're not perfect, right? Well, imagine sitting before the creator of the universe. How did this happen? Boom, he'd tell him. How did that happen? Boom, he'd tell him. Another thing that he could do, he could see in your heart. What's wrong? Why are you doubting? Whoa, whoa, what happened? Your teachers can't do that now, right? So three years spent asking any question, hearing his sermons, not only that, not only in a classroom, but walking with him, living with him, eating with him, serving with him. They had been with Jesus. These men were educated by the creator of the universe. I have thought maybe they didn't have an Ivy League education, but they sure had a heavenly one. These guys were educated before the master, the creator of the universe. Peter had learned from being with Jesus that Jesus' love for him was deep and enduring. That his love, Jesus' love for him, did not change regardless of the mishaps or failures that Peter did. It is my prayer that we will see that Jesus' love for us is deep and enduring. That you will see that if you are in Christ, you are a pillar because Jesus loves you even when he fully knows you. He loves you even when the trials that you go through make it feel like maybe he doesn't love you. He loves you even when you feel that you have failed or maybe you have failed and you've disappointed him or yourself. So let's begin with the first one. You are a pillar because Jesus loves you even when he knows everything about you. Scripture tells us that God knows everything about us, right? No surprise to God, anything. Jeremiah 1.5, speaking to Jeremiah, God said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And then Psalm 139, 1 through 4 says, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue. But behold, O Lord, you know it all together. And speaking about Jesus, John 2, 24 to 25 says, 
But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. You see, when Jesus commissioned Peter, from the beginning he knew altogether who Peter was. He knew Peter needed work. And one specific thing, as I examined the scriptures that Peter needed help with, was pride. There was pride hidden within Peter's heart, and Jesus needed to expose that, and he did. Didn't love him any less? I don't even remember Jesus ever telling him, Peter, you're a prideful man. No, he tried to warn him, Peter, over and over, give him examples. Peter, let me wash your feet. No, not my feet. Peter, he, you know, he gave him um, opportunities to that, but he never changed his love for him. But he had a pride issue. Let me give you some examples. Remember when Jesus told Peter that he would make him a fisher of men. Peter was out there fishing with John, and they were fishing for a long time. All night, it says, they toiled, and they were catching nothing. And Jesus came and said, hey, throw your net over on that side. And, well, Peter felt like he had to educate Jesus, you know. He, he was a fisherman after all, right? So he tells him, Master, we've been toiling at this all night, and we haven't caught nothing. But, okay, I'm warning you, but... I'll throw it in because you tell me. So what does he do? He throws it in, and he catches so many fish that they were having trouble dragging it in. And Peter, at that point, began to realize his response was, Lord, step away from me. I am a sinful man. He started realizing that he was before divinity, that he was before the God of the universe that knew way more than he would ever know in his finite life. Another example was when Peter went to wash his feet. When Jesus went to wash Peter's feet in John 13, what was Peter's reaction? <laughs> Lord, you are washing my feet? <laughs> no, not mine. And then Jesus told them, well, if I don't wash your feet, you have nothing with me. Okay, in that case, wash everything with me. You know, the pride quickly kind of disappeared. But he had this issue going on in his heart. When Jesus began to tell Peter how he was going to die in John 21, Peter was like, you know, instead of listening, he was like, well, what about him? How is he going to die? You know, it's kind of like us when we come to service and the Lord's ministering to us and convicting our heart. And we're like, oh, man, I wish my cousin would be here today. He would really be ministered to today. And the Lord's trying to speak to your heart or my heart. And we're like, man, if they would be here, they would, that pride would just go out the door. You know, they would grow up so quickly. <laughs> Peter did that. He looked at others and started focusing on everybody else but himself. When Jesus was telling them, that they would all scatter. What was Peter's response in Matthew 26, 33? He says, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And when Jesus told him he would deny him, he said, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Peter had a pride issue of which he was not aware. You see, you guys, pride is subtle. It is hard to detect it in yourself. Peter had no clue about this pride. His dependence on himself to do God's work had to be exposed in a different way. And I wanted to point out that pride, this is an obvious pride that you can see on the other side, right? When somebody, I can do it, I don't need you. Get away from me. I don't need no help. That's an obvious pride. But there's another type of pride that is not so obvious, but it's still pride. It's called false humility. You ever seen, oh, what a great job. Oh, no, brothers, not me. It's the Lord. God does it all. You know, it reminds me of a story of a, of a preacher. An old, you know, he got up to the pulpit, and in his, in his congregation was an old seasoned preacher who had retired, wasn't preaching anymore. But he saw this guy preaching with power, and he saw that he put a lot of work into his study. So the old man thought he'd encourage him, and he comes up to him afterwards, and he says, Son, that was a tremendous study. Good job. Oh, no, you know, it was, it was all God. So the seasoned preacher goes, Son, it wasn't all God. Because if it was all God, it would have been a lot better. <laughs> False humility is pride too. We have to find that balance, and it's really hard to do it ourselves. God has to expose it for us. And he will, and he does, and we will see as we move forward. Jesus knew all these things about Peter, and yet his love did not waver toward Peter. He still trained him. 
he still poured into Peter. He still mentored Peter. He loved Peter. You see, God knows everything about you. He loves you for you. And he isn't surprised at your perceived shortcomings. He isn't surprised at the times that you fail. Or he's not even surprised at the shortcomings that you don't perceive yet. You might see him 20, 19 years down in your walk. And you're like, whoa, where has this been all my life? I just asked your wife. It's been there all the time, but you just didn't see it, right? But he starts revealing and he keeps working on you. And he's going to keep working on you until the end, right? When we're delivered of this flesh that is full of sin, until then. But he loves you regardless of all your failings, regardless of those things that you're like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that about me. He's not surprised. He knows you all together, and yet he loves you. And he gave his son for you, even that, while you were his enemy. So remember that. Remember that. Some things in our life, God obliterates instantly. Drugs, I mean, for me, drugs, drinking, everything. You just wipe them all out. And other things are purged through sanctification. You guys know what sanctification is, right? Justification, the moment you believe, the moment you accept Christ into your life, into your heart, that day, your, your name is in heaven. So-and-so belongs here. Jose Ramirez belongs here. You're saved. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But while you're on this side of heaven, you're being sanctified. You're being chiseled away. You're, you're listening to the word, and God is changing you. God is exposing areas of your life that need to be transformed, and slowly he's chiseling you. To what? To be into the image of his son, right? So we, we see that. He has to do some slowly. You are a pillar because Jesus loves you even when he knows everything about you. And the next point, you are a pillar because Jesus loves you even when the trials you go through make it feel otherwise. When Jesus called Peter, remember with me, Peter gave it all up to follow Jesus. His business, his trade, he left his career, he, knew, he left what he knew best being a fisherman. Peter was personally mentored by Jesus. He was one of the elite three. If you read throughout scriptures, there's certain times when Jesus just takes three people with him, Peter, James, and John. And he shows them special. He transfigured himself before them. He had a special calling for these men, and Peter was one of them. Peter saw some amazing things being performed by Jesus. He saw the healing of his mother-in-law. He saw the transfiguration. He saw Jesus. He saw Jesus walked on water, and he walked on water. Remember that when Jesus called him out and he started walking. And while he kept his eyes on Jesus, everything was okay. The moment he looked at the waves, he started to sink, right? And Jesus saved me, and he took him out. But he walked on water. Remember that time when Jesus was being uh, confronted about not paying taxes, and Peter was being confronted, how come you guys don't pay taxes? And Jesus told Peter, go, go grab a fish. And inside the fish, you're going to find some money. Pay him for you and for me. I don't know about you. And some people might say, well, was it there or did he make it? I don't care. If he made the money in his mouth, that's amazing. If he knew x-ray vision somehow and saw the money in the fish's mouth, what an awesome miracle anyway, right? Or if the fish just happened to be at the right time and he says, get that one. It doesn't matter. Peter had the opportunity to see all these things. We hear about him. He saw them firsthand. Peter loved Jesus and was loyal to him. Remember, he was willing to fight for Jesus. When they came to arrest him, what did he do? First thing, without even thinking, takes out the knife and tries to slice the guy and cuts his ear off, and Jesus has to take care of him. Oh, Peter, there you go again. You know, impulsive Peter, slow down. You know, it's time puts the ear back on. He knew everything about him. He loved him. When Jesus was arrested and murdered eventually, that was a great trial for Peter. He had given it all up. He invested the last three years into this man who believed to be the Messiah, who he believed to be the Messiah, and now he is gone. Perhaps the sentiment was what other people were already saying, he saved others. Why didn't he save himself? Was he the Messiah? I, I could imagine all these things probably going to his head. Was it really the Messiah? 
What happened? What happened? Why did I really believe I just denied him? What happened? All these things that could have probably been racing to his mind. And it's the same thing that can often and does happen to us. We know God's power. He has done some great things in us and around us. He's transformed us. We've been following him faithfully. And then trials come our way and we are often shaken. An unexpected disease. An unexpected death of a loved one. A job loss. A wayward son or daughter. And we can often ask, wait, what happened? You see, we are human and we wonder. In fact, this is one of the areas that atheists like to focus on. You've heard it. If God is so powerful and so good, then why does evil happen? Why terrorism? Why death? Why are planes falling from the sky? Why pain? You see, I was there, I remember, clearly. When I was 15, I was exactly, this was exactly what Satan used in my life to alienate me from God. I was at my mom's funeral, and I was not in, you know, not in throat. I was tired of crying. I was done. You see, three, six months before that, I was at my grandpa's funeral. And my grandpa has, I respected him with all my heart. I loved him. And he gave me hope when three months from his funeral, my dad died. And I was like, <laughs> what happened? In nine months, I lost the three most important people of my life. God? What God? Where is he? So the day that I buried my, do- my mother, That same day, I buried God. God died for me. And I lived the rest of my life with extreme bitterness and anger. And my only hope was if I died or was killed or overdosed on drugs, I would be with my parents, wherever they were. I didn't care at that point. I just wanted to reunite and it would be all okay. And obviously, God intervened in my life. But one of the things throughout all these trials and 19 years later walking with the Lord, one of the things that the Lord has taught me through trials is to be careful that because you've gone through certain things, sometimes it's very easy to look at somebody else who, in your eyes, that's nothing, you know. And don't get caught into what I like to call a trial athlon. You ever been in a triathlon? Who knows what I'm talking about? (laughs) Well, you should have seen what I did. I was a druggie, and I did three types of drugs. Oh, yeah? Well, I did this. You know, don't do that. And we we will do that. Be careful that you don't do that. And be careful that your trials, that somebody who's coming to you and saying, you know what, I feel rejected. I feel dejected. I feel like I don't fit anywhere. And if you've gone through certain things, you might say, oh, come on, get over it. That's nothing. We love you. Move on. Be careful because in your mind that be, may seem like a small thing. But did you, do you guys know how many teenagers die every year of suicide because they don't fit in? Because they feel rejected. Because they feel that nobody loves them. So what you think is a small trial could probably be the end of somebody else's life. So be careful that instead of having compassion because of everything that you've gone through, you become hardened towards other smaller, insignificant in your eyes things because every trial is unique. That's one of the things that the Lord taught me early, even before I knew him. I was, when I was there with my mom, somebody came up to me and said, oh, it's going to be okay. I lost this and this and this. And all I can look, think of is looking in their eyes and saying, I don't care. I'm hurting right now. Don't come and tell me about all your things. There's a time for that, guys. Trust me. What does Scripture say? That he will comfort you so that you may comfort others with the comfort that you have received. One day you'll have that opportunity and somebody will come to you and say, how did you do it? What what did God tell you? That is the appropriate time to share your heart 
to share what God has done. So she might just say, I have no idea, man. God transformed my life. And he's been teaching me to scriptures. But there's an appropriate time. When somebody's hurting and in a trial, don't dismiss it so quickly. Just listen. You know, Job's friends did that for a good time until they got tired and then they started giving them all the wrong advice. Don't be like that. Just listen. And the appropriate time, when you're asked, let them know. Let them know what God has done in your life because God has allowed those things in your life so that you may comfort others with that same comfort that he has given you. So obviously, God intervened in my life. He opened my eyes. He forgave my rebellion. He helped me understand through his word that it isn't God who brings the evil and the death. It took a while as I was studying through scripture and with those questions in my mind, when God drew me to himself, I I was reading scripture loaded, you know. I was on methamphetamines and I would read scripture all night. You know, people like to draw and write. I was reading scripture and all of a sudden it started lighting up. Well, no, that's not a good metaphor for that, right? Not lighting up. It started opening up and my, my mind started comprehending and my heart started breaking. I had no idea. The bitterness started going away. I started having compassion, and I was like, ooh, what's that? Why do I care about people? You know, before, I could care less about anybody because it was all about me. I was mad. God messed me up, so I don't care about anybody. I didn't want to get married. I didn't want to work. I didn't want to go to school. Dropped out in ninth grade. I said, school's for dummies who need to learn something. <laughs> I, so I was 15, so I guess I thought I knew it all. So I dropped out. But God intervened, and as I was reading Scripture, and as I was studying, as I was coming to Pastor here, Pastor David, and I was hearing the Scriptures, God showed me it wasn't God who brings the evil and the death. It is sin. It was Satan. When I was there with my mom, and I remember distinctly hearing a voice, if there's a God, he just wants you to cry. And me, a a Mexican, practicing machismo, I said, there's no way I'm going to cry for anybody. I'm done crying. And my heart became bitter, and my life started emulating a rejection of God completely. But I remember, as now as I studied, I look back and say, that was Satan in my mind. That was Satan just alienating me. And he does that to believers and to non-believers. He alienates you from God. And then what do they say after that? What do atheists or people who reject God, they say, well then, if God is powerful and loving, why doesn't he just destroy evil? Why is it still here? And the answer to those who reject God, you can look at them in the face and say it is still here because he loves you. Because he loves you. You see, when God obliterates evil in the end, he's going to wipe it all out. He's not going to leave a trace behind it. So if there is even a hint of evil in your heart that has not been dealt with, you will be wiped out along with all the evil in the world. But God loves humanity, and he's giving an opportunity for the evil to be dealt with through his son. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, talking about his promise of returning, as some count slackness. But he is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Evil will be obliterated completely one day. We know that. Jesus will return and reign, and he will take care of the devil and all the evil that exists. But you see, the souls of those that are being saved are far more important to God than proving to an atheist that he has power. The souls of those that are being saved are far more important to God than proving to a militant atheist that he has power. In fact, he already has showed his power. He created the world and everything in it by his word. He raised his son from the dead after he was unjustly treated and murdered. They want to see power? 
Check it out. It was written 2,000 years ago. But they choose to reject it. They willfully forget that and deny God's power and goodness. They try to convince themselves that what they do and have is by their own strength. You know, that what they do, what they're able to do. But the truth is, as I've, I've examined this over and over with people I work, not everybody believes, and, and I, I love hanging out with them. You know why? I've been studying, I studied a while back, common grace. And common grace is just a grace that God gives to everybody in creation. He made people in his image. And I work with people who reject God or don't talk about God. But you know what? When I see their lives and I see the things that they're able to create, the things that they're able to draw or program or make or work or, I mean, the project plans, amazing project plans, I trip out. And, I, and I'm glorifying God because even though they don't want to accept God with their lips, they're affirming him with the works that they did. And the only reason they can do those things is because God created them. Because God made them in his image, right? From the beginning. He made them. He created them. We all have intelligence. We all have creativity because of God. They choose to reject it. But if you start doing that and you look and see beyond the abuse that they give you or call you names and all this and you see, wow, the things you do, if you only knew the source, you would be amazed yourself at yourself, you know, because it's not from you. God put it there. God made it. One day, evil will be obliterated, but they willfully forget. They try to convince themselves, but as we just mentioned, the, the truth is that the intelligence, the creativity that they display, the talents that they have acquired have come because they have been designed to be able to do that. They are affirming, again, by their works, the very God they reject with their mouths. They are affirming by their works the very creator who made them the ability to gave them the ability to do that. They are, they do, they think because God designed them with those traits. It reminds me of a story, you know, talking about they think it's all about them and that they did it all. It reminds me of a story of an old lady who, who loved and trusted God. One day, she was praying at her window like she was always used to doing. But she, she was asking for provision. She ran out of groceries, so she was praying, Lord, I need groceries. You've probably heard this. And this guy is passing by, and he doesn't believe, and he's like, he hears her asking for groceries. He's like, ha, I'm going to show this Christian. And he goes to the store. He buys two bagfuls of groceries and stacks them up to the brim, brings them, puts them at the door, and knocks and runs behind a bush like a little boy. Oh, I'm going to get her, right? And she's hiding, and the lady comes out and looks and immediately turns up to heaven. God, thank you for providing and he jumps out and runs right in front of her and says, it wasn't God, it was me. I bought them for you. I heard you in your window when you were crying out to God, and I went and bought them for you. And she smiles and looks at him and looks up back to heaven and says, thank you for providing, and you even used the devil to bring him to me. <laughs> he wouldn't have been able to buy them if he didn't have work. He wouldn't have work if he didn't have a brain. He wouldn't have a brain if God didn't put it there. It all comes from God. He makes man. He designs them. Jesus told us in John 16, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, it's a promise, you will have tribulation. But what else does he say? But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. While we are in this world that is tainted with sin, where Satan instigates against God, we will see things happen that are unfair, that don't seem right, that are evil because they are evil. But we can always know that he has overcome the world. You see, you guys, trials for the believer are part, as we explained, of the sanctification process. They are used to build our character. James 1, 2-3 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. These trials are used also to show us issues in our own heart that we may not have seen without them. Peter had pride, 
And even though Jesus himself had warned him of an upcoming denial, Peter's pride blinded him even to the possibility that he could ever fail Jesus. And it wasn't until the trial hit, until that trial happened, that Peter saw what he was capable of in his fleshly heart. Matthew 26, 75 says, And Peter, after he denied him, remembered the word of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. He had to go through that trial to be able to see what he was capable of. Trials and tre- tests are also used to show us our continual need for God's grace. Jesus knows it all. He's not surprised. Why do trials and tests come to our life? So that we can see what's in our heart. So that we can become aware. Wow, I can deny God in an instant if I'm trusting in myself. Deuteronomy 8.2 says, And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the, the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Job 23.10 says, But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. So does it mean that Christianity and walking with God is all doom and gloom? It's all trials and tests, nothing good, no way. You see, I'm always careful. I don't like to tell people, come to Jesus and he's going to give you a mansion here on earth. Come to Jesus and he's going to give you a BMW. Come to Jesus and your life's going to be the best thing ever. Because sometimes it doesn't work that way, right? We are in a fallen world. But on the other hand, I also don't want to hold back and, and, and tell him what the scripture does say and what God has done in my life. You see, he forgave me, and he, and he does many things, but he still works. He does manifest himself in this trial-ridden world. I had a, a friend, Joe, who, who passed away a few years ago now, but he passed away, and he, he was an Iranian guy, good friend of mine, and, you know, we had our differences, obviously differences, and we would talk about politics and God and all kinds of things, but one thing that he would tell me, he loved his father-in-law. You see, his father-in-law was like a third-generation pastor. Or, I mean, he was of a line of pastors, and he loved God. And Joe would see him and always be like, wow, that guy's the real deal. You know, he, 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 would just, he just inspired Joe, even though Joe at that time didn't believe. And one of the stories he told me about his father-in-law really touched my heart and showed me how God works in the natural, sometimes so natural that you miss the supernatural. You know, he, 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 um, he told me about his father-in-law who was praying for a car, and he was asking, he told his son, you know, my car's about to break. It's not working. And in that moment, his son, in his mind, he didn't say anything, but in his heart, he's like, you know what, I'm going to get my dad a car. So he started working overtime. He started working, saving what he could, saving, 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 so that he can buy that car for his father, father-in-law. And finally, he saved it all up, and he went so excited and bought this car, and he drove it up, and he didn't tell his dad anything. But that day, when he drove up, and he knocked on the door, he looked at his mom and says, where's dad? Oh, he's in the garage. And he walks in the garage, and his dad was on his knee with his Bible on the car, asking God, saying, my car, it was broken that day. And his son just looked at him, and he goes, dad. I got you a car. And he grabbed his son, put him down on his knees, and together they praised God. You see, in the natural, it seems so natural, but God works all things together for good. And he did this at the perfect timing to show that he still manifests himself in this fallen world. For me, God forgave me of all my anger, all the hurt, all the cussing that I sent his way. God blessed my life with an amazing wife that I did not deserve. You see, I was a punk. And he gave me this beautiful girl, pure girl. And I was like, are you sure, Lord? <laughs> you can entrust me with her? 
You see, if my wife would have seen me when I was in the world, she would have walked on the other side and been like, watch that guy. And if she would have walked close, she would have been like, let's get away from that guy. But God saved me, forgave me, gave me his son, forgiveness for all eternity, and still gave me a beautiful wife. And not only that, I didn't want kids, but now I have four <laughs> that I love with all my heart. Education, who needs education? Something happened. When I got saved, I started getting hunger for knowledge. I, I want to go back to school. It was hard. You know, all those burnt cells that were like not working. I was like, ha, what happened? <laughs> but by God's grace, in 2011, I finished my bachelor's degree. And you know what? Yeah, praise God. <laughs> praise God. And right now, I just, I'm on my second graduate level class. I might get a master's degree. Oh, my goodness. God is amazing. He does do good works. He changes your life. He changes your perspective. And if he wants you in an office, he's going to get you the work to go to the office. He's going to make you work to get in that office, right? I remember going to Kmart to get my typing because I was like, peck, 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 peck. That wasn't working. So he starts putting desires in your heart. And he starts fulfilling them. And he starts using you. You see, you guys, not all of us are going to be behind a pulpit. But all of us are called to take the gospel wherever we are. And wherever you are, do it with all your might. If you're a programmer, make the best program. Maybe you'll be like the Facebook guys, you know, <laughs> or the Google guys. I still want to meet them. But. <laughs> but if God has gifted you something, do that. It's not less. It's not better if you're in, in the pulpit or if you're in the full-time ministry. It's not. Whatever God calls you to do. That is the best for you because you know what? He might use you in that office to reach somebody who would have never heard the gospel unless he put you there. So take every opportunity to magnify him wherever he places you. God has manifested himself so much in my life and he will in yours too. Yes, he will change you and yes, there will be difficulties, but he has overcome the world. Peter was made keenly aware of his weaknesses. You see, without that trial, he would have never have seen what he was capable of. He was made a pillar first by breaking his flesh. He had to fail in his own strength to learn to fully depend on God's strength. You are a pillar because Jesus loves you even when the trials may feel otherwise. Third point, you are a pillar because Jesus loves you even when you fail and you feel you have disappointed him. Or yourself. Turn with me to John 21 real quick. Let's read John 21, 1 through 5 as we get ready to wrap up here. John 21, 1 through 5 it says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples of the, at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, well, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And they answered him, No. Notice that Peter says, I'm going fishing. He felt like a failure. He was discouraged. He denied Christ. Christ was not around. I mean, he had seen him already, but he still was struggling. He was anxious. So he says, I'm going fishing. And, and as we read earlier, he had failed and he had denied and, and he had failed himself. So what does he do? He leaves the mountain where Jesus had asked him to wait. Matthew 28, 16, Jesus had asked him to stay in the mountain, but he went fishing. He returns to what he was comfortable with. You've probably been there. You've gone or are going through a trial or a disappointment. You're frustrated. And what do you do? You find something you're comfortable with, right? I'm going shopping. I'm going eating. That's what I do. I'm going programming to get my mind off of everything and, or learn how to do it. 
Peter's was, I'm going fishing. But for Peter, it was not just a quick fix he was seeking. He was discouraged and he was returning to the old livelihood, even though Jesus had already told them he was called to be a fisher of men. So what happens? <laughs> Look at the Lord's humor in this in verse 5. He could have well said, hey, how's that working for you? They caught nothing, right? They weren't able to catch anything. Jesus was showing Peter that he was called to a specific role. And Peter's attempts to thwart that were not going to work. Why? Because Jesus was going to make sure of it. He had called him for a specific purpose. So what does Jesus do? He replays the whole scenario of when he had commissioned Peter to be a fisher of men. Again, remember that time when, Jesus, when uh, Peter was fishing and they weren't catching anything? It happened before. And Peter tries to educate Jesus. It's happening again. This time he didn't try to educate Jesus, but the whole scenario happened again. And that was the moment that Jesus told him, you will be a fisher of men. So he allows it to happen again so that he can remember what he was supposed to do and stop trying to get away from it. Let's read John. After that, after that reminder, he proceeds to verbally recommission Peter when he reaffirms his love and restores him, right? In John 21, 15 through 17. Let's read that really quickly here. It says, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. Go do what I told you. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. Now he had learned, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I want you guys to notice something here by its absence. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three. How many times did Jesus ask Peter if he loved him? How many times did Peter need to ask Jesus if he still loved him? Big zero. None. Peter didn't need to ask Jesus how much he loved him. All he had to do was look back at what had just taken place, the death, the crucifixion, the burial, for him, for his sin. He had that etched in his mind forever. G uh, Peter became a pillar because that was etched in his mind. He would never forget the love that his Savior showed him on the cross. All he had to do was look back. Now Peter understood the words of Jesus in John 15, 3, when Jesus said, Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus had given the ultimate sign of his love for his people, for us. So when you're in that trial, when you're in that difficulty, when you're having trouble trying to find joy, turn your mind to the cross. When the enemy puts in your heart, you just messed up. You think Jesus loves you? You can very easily say, yeah, because he knew me before he chose me. He knew me altogether. Yes, because he died on the cross for my sins. The enemy hates that because that is the place where he couldn't win. Jesus stomped on his head, right? And he won the victory. He overcame Satan. He overcame the world. So when you're having trouble, remember the cross. And that will remind you of his love. And nobody can take that from you. If you believe the gospel, Jesus Christ has transformed you, has opened your eyes to understand that it is for you. There's nothing. Nobody can take you and snatch you from his hands. You are his. And in closing here, so what do we do? Do we just kick back and... I mean, God forgives us and loves us. Well, no, we know that, right? Romans 6, 12, shall us, so we continue in sin that grace may abound. We don't try to sin, but when we do sin, we know we have our Redeemer, right? John 1, 9 tells us that if you have sinned, confess your sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive you 
of all your sins. What else do we do? Well, you've heard it over and over, Pastor David telling us, for 33 years, for me, 19 years. But sometimes the basics are the first to go when you're in a trial. The things that are going to hold you the strongest are the first things we let go. So just a reminder, the Word of God, and if you want to look it up, 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. The worship of God, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5. The witness with God's people, 1 Peter 1, 22. And the witness to God's creatures, his creation. Go witness the gospel. These are the things that we have to keep doing, no matter you're 19 years in the Lord, 50 years in the Lord. Don't forget these principles. These are the ones the enemy tries to snatch away right away, but they're the ones that keep you strong. And we've had a faithful pastor who has shared that with us over and over. It's my prayer, you guys, that you have seen that God loves you. No matter, he already knew you all together before he came, before um, he, you came to him. He loves you even in the midst of trials. When the enemy tries to tell you differently, he loves you. And he loves you when you feel like you failed. When possibly you didn't obey something, ask for forgiveness and come right back. He's right there waiting for you to come back.